good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for our weekly update. Very special hello to Chloe and Knox. I'm very pleased, as always, to be joined by Dr. Lawrence Lowe, our Chief Medical Officer of Health, Darren Rizzi, our Fire Chief and Director of Emergency Management, Sam Rogers, our Director of Enforcement, and this week we have a very special guest, Dr. Peter Uni, the Scientific Director of Ontario's Science Table. I've been strongly advocating for the province to lift restrictions on outdoor recreation. And I have invited Dr. Uni here today to talk a little bit about the low risk of transmission in outdoor settings and why it's so important to open these public spaces up for use. I want to recognize that today is International Nurses Day. And I want to thank all the nurses at Public Health, Trillium Health Partners, and across Mississauga for supporting our community. Our nurses have played a critical role in the battle against this virus, taking care of COVID patients, administering tests, and of course, administering vaccines. On behalf of the City of Mississauga, I want to thank everyone for working together to get this all done. Last week, I told you that I was starting to feel hopeful, cautiously optimistic about the COVID-19 situation facing Mississauga and all of Peel. And this week, my optimism is growing a little further. Our COVID-19 numbers continue to move in the right direction, with daily case counts decreasing by 2.5% almost each day. Peel Region is now averaging 297 cases per 100,000, which is down from 347 per 100,000 a week ago. Mississauga is averaging 240 cases per 100,000, and that's down from 282 a week ago. And the situation in our hospitals is beginning to stabilize. In Mississauga, Trillium is dealing with 90 COVID patients, 23 patients in the ICU, and another 19 suspected COVID cases. The situation is similar at William Osler Hospital, with 65 COVID hospitalizations, 11 patients in the ICU, and 47 suspected cases. But what's truly giving me the most hope is that our vaccine rollout has been completely ramped up here in the region of Peel, with everyone 18 and older now eligible for the vaccine. This was so critical for us to do here in Peel region. We have been hit so hard by this virus and it's been largely due to the fact that we have so many essential workers here in the region of Peel. People who continue to leave their homes in each and every day to work in factories, warehouses, distribution centers, food processing plants, and who have kept our economy running. They go to work so we don't have to. And they provide everyone with the products we need to survive this pandemic. I am so relieved that, um, that we can offer the vaccine to them and all of our residents who are 18 plus living in Peel. This week by far is our busiest and biggest in terms of vaccinations. We're administering close to 20,000 doses per day in Peel. And this week we will get 150,000 shots in arms. To date, we have administered well over 700,000 doses, meaning that 50% of all eligible residents in Peel have received their first dose. This is just staggering, and it's an incredible accomplishment. We have vaccinated 68% of those people who are 80 plus, 75% of those people who are 65 to 79, 72% of those 60 to 64, 68% of those who are 55 to 59, 62% of those 50 to 54, and then 39% of those 45 to 49, and only 18% of those 30 to 39, and 17% of those 18 to 29. So please book your appointment quite soon. We're well on our way to getting 75% of our first dose coverage of our adult population by the end of May. 
and I want to thank the Government of Ontario for prioritizing regions like Peel, sending 50% of all the province's vaccines to hotspots for the first two weeks in May. And we're having active and promising conversations with our provincial partners to ensure we continue to get doses that we need here in Peel so that we can continue offering the vaccine to any adult who wants one in the coming weeks. I also want to take a moment to thank Dr. Lawrence Lowe and the entire team at Peel Public Health, as well as the team at Trillium Health Partners for the incredible work that they're doing in getting our community vaccinated. I want to thank our paramedics, our firefighters, and all of the volunteers at all of our vaccination sites who are helping with this very historic effort. Every single day, I'm getting messages from residents who are telling me just how easy it was for them to get their vaccine at Trillium Health Partners at UTM, at Paramount Fine Food Centre, or one of our other mass vaccination centres. To all of those who have not yet booked their appointment, please do so as soon as you can. Again, the vaccine is available to everyone, 18 plus in Mississauga and across Peel, regardless of where you live. You have a number of ways to get vaccinated. You can book an appointment at one of the 11 mass vaccination centres right across the region of Peel or through our hospital partners. The easiest way to book is by visiting peelregion.ca forward slash COVID-19 vaccine. We have the supply and we have a lot of appointments, so please book. We did get the news yesterday that Ontario is suspending first doses of the AstraZeneca vaccine out of an abundance of caution because of the risk of a rare blood clotting condition called VITT, V-I-T-T. But we do have select pharmacies in the region that are offering Pfizer and Moderna to all residents 18 and older. And the province announced today that more doses of Pfizer and Moderna will be made available at pharmacies by the end of May. Peel Public Health is also launching an exciting new initiative called Doses After Dark, which will run this weekend, May 15th and 16th, over a 32-hour period. We're hoping to vaccinate 30, excuse me, we're hoping to administer 7,600 vaccines. And as the name suggests, we're going to be going straight through the night. If you haven't been vaccinated, this is a great way to get your first jab. To register, please visit peelregion.ca forward slash COVID-19 vaccine. We're also continuing to move forward with a number of pop-up clinics to reach our most vulnerable residents, as well as workplace clinics to vaccinate our essential workers. And next Monday and Tuesday, we will be launching a vaccine clinic for MyWay Transit staff at our Central Parkway tra Transit Campus. In addition to mobile clinics uh, that will run on Wednesday at the same location, and that one will be open to all essential city employees. I want to thank the Region of Peel and the Government of Ontario for partnering with us on this clinic. MyWay staff and so many of our city employees have been essential in keeping Mississauga operating. And I'm thrilled we're setting up a clinic to make it easier for them to get vaccinated. We also got the great news that the province hopes to start offering the vaccine to children aged 12 to 17 starting in June. This is so important to get kids back to school this fall and keeping them in the classroom. I really can't stress enough just how important getting the vaccine is. It's the best way to protect yourself, your loved ones, and the entire community. And it will be critical in preventing a fourth wave in our community. So please, Mississauga, go out and get vaccinated. All of this progress is incredible news. The less encouraging news is that we're anticipating that the province-wide stay-at-home order may be extended. We still haven't got any official word from the province about how long it will be in effect, but what we're hearing is it may be extended until June 2nd, 
but we'd like some more clarity on this issue. Along with the other GTHA mayors, I'm asking the province provide us with this information as soon as possible. The residents and business owners need clarity and they're asking some very reasonable questions as to what the situation will look like going forward so that people can plan their lives. We also need clear criteria on what it will take to see the reopenings. The province has signaled that because of uh, the transmissibility of the new variants, daily case counts need to be less than 1,000 per day across the province before the stay-at-home measure is lifted. But again, there has been no official announcement on this. We also need to know if we're moving back to the color-coded framework after the stay-at-home measure is lifted. This is critical information, particularly for small business owners who have been severely impacted by the extended lockdown. We all understand and accept that it's going to take more time before we see in-person shopping, let alone indoor dining. But we need real, tangible benchmarks to work towards and a clearly defined plan. This is so important for practical reasons, but it also gives people hope. Hope that all of our hard work is finally paying off. I really can't thank Mrs. Soggins enough for continuing to make huge sacrifices for the collective good, for continuing to follow public health advice. And the reality is that we're going to have to keep following a lot of these measures for the foreseeable future. The truth is, not all of these measures make sense, at least to me. And not all of them are fair. It's time that the restrictions on outdoor recreation are lifted. Outdoor recreation is essential to the physical and mental health of so many residents, and in particular, our children, who are often stuck inside all day long doing their online learning. They need a way to let off the steam. In Mississauga, city staff do not want to lock up the tennis courts or put barriers on our basketball nets. This was a provincial order that the city was obliged to follow. I understand the province's intent for restricting outdoor recreation to limit mobility at a time when case counts were increasing, but this policy was never based on science. The science is actually quite clear that the risk of transmission outside is incredibly low if physical distancing precautions are followed. And the province's own advisory table made it very clear how important it was to allow people to do these activities. In fact, the science table specifically advised that the province not limit outdoor recreation. I'm hoping that the province will lift the restrictions very soon, especially as the weather gets nicer and as our case counts continue to decrease. I've asked Dr. Peter Uni here today to talk more about the importance of opening, out, out, opening up outdoor recreation and what the science is telling us. Dr. Uni, the floor is now yours. Please. Thanks a lot. <clears throat> I hope you can hear me, do you? Yes, we can, yes, Dr. Uni, thank you. Okay, good. Yes, I think the um, point here is that we need um, to clearly distinguish between indoor and outdoor space whenever we talk about, you know, the continued control of this pandemic. And what we have learned over the last 14 months or 15 months is that this virus really strives indoors and it gets much more easily transmitted indoors than outdoors. Um, right now, you know, the best data available out there indicate that it's probably about 20 times safer to be outdoors than to be indoors. What this means is that if we talk about reopenings, the logical step to make first is to indeed open outdoor venues and of course do that safely. Especially with the new variants, you know, the risk is not zero if you're outdoors, so you just can't let things slip in terms of, you know, letting go of all the safeguards. But what is clear is that if we just uh, stick to distance of two meters, if we meet somebody who is not part of our household or if we wear a mask, if we can't stick to two meters distance, basically, 
then we should be safe. The risk is perhaps not null, but it's greatly, greatly reduced. And this is really important now, that we just have this clear distinction and just are aware of, we need, if we're inside, you know, if we're, if we're actually forced to work with other people, for instance, inside in an essential workplace, always to wear a mask, but we should strive to be outside. And if we meet other people, only do that outside. This is absolutely possible and doable. We need to be aware of now we're in a situation we're all fatigued. Uh, we basically have a need for social interaction. This can be done really safely outside and what we actually don't want, we don't want people to move inside and hide inside to meet, but we would like just to make outdoor spaces as safe as possible. And this will help you know, with the mental health, it will help basically with the social needs that we're having, and will, it will also help you know, uh, to get us, including myself, you know, to stay fit again or become fit again if we're allowed to play beach volleyball, basketball, you name it. This can be done safely if you can't stay away two meters from each other, if you don't belong to the same family, this means wear a mask. Same holds, by the way, for all the kids on playgrounds. You know, kids it's typically can't stay two meters apart from each other. Again, what the, the conclusion then would be, have kids who are, you know, in, a, in kindergarten or in school, just wear a mask on the playground to keep all of that safe. But we don't want, we don't want this to backfire. And of course, there were examples out there. Uh, you know, indicating that, uh, for, for instance, you know, five people meeting um, on a backyard, uh, from a house, but uh, outside clearly, but not sticking to uh, their, to the safeguards. All five got infected, three of them got hospitalized. We don't want that. Therefore, it's important that we clearly message um, that if you're outside, if you meet other people, stay away for two meters. If you can't do that, wear a mask. It's simple. Don't overthink it, but follow the rules. We want to get this pandemic under control. And it's as much, you know, the, the public health measures and these safeguards than the vaccines that will help to get the thing under control. And we're all aware of, especially in Peel, it's very challenging to bring these case numbers down. So let's just do the right thing together. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, That's Dr. all I had to say so far, unless there would be other aspects that you would like me to cover. Um, Dr. Uni, please stay put. And uh, when we are uh, into the question period, uh, there may be questions addressed to you if you have the time. So we would appreciate it. Thank you so much. Um, Sounds good. Thank you again. Uh, now, Dr. Uni, now I would like to invite our Dr. Lawrence Lowe, our very own medical officer of health, to come to the podium. Dr. Lowe. Thank you, Madam Mayor, and good afternoon. I'd like to start my remarks by wishing all of our nurses a happy Nurses Week, happy Nursing Day on the anniversary of Florence Nightingale. Uh, and thank you all uh, for your dedication and service uh, throughout this global pandemic. I'd also like to thank Dr. Peter Uni and the Ontario Science Table. Uh, Peter, it's nice to have you here today uh, to speak on uh, this important subject. Uh, and we know that the Ontario Science Table has done tremendous work uh, to help keep our communities safe. Mississauga's weekly incidence rate for COVID-19 currently sits at 240 per 100,000, with a test positivity of 12.3%. These are both down from last week. We've hit some major milestones this week. Tragically, we saw on Sunday 100,000 cases reported in the region of Peel since the pandemic started. But as of yesterday, we also hit 50% first dose coverage among our residents for COVID-19 vaccination. Taking these trends together, I am cautiously optimistic. Now, we have seen this picture before in previous waves. Cases are coming down, but our hospital picture is still stressed and volatile. We know what happens if we open too quickly while a significant proportion of our community remains vulnerable to this novel virus. However, as we vaccinate, we are reducing our collective vulnerability. Where our picture differs from the previous two waves is in the machinery of our vaccination program and our rapidly increasing first dose coverage. 
I want to thank the province for the increase in vaccine allocations to hotspots that have benefited our community. We are now delivering 20,000 doses a day, including 150,000 doses targeted for this week alone, equivalent to adding almost 14% more first dose coverage in Peel. A quick reminder for all of our adult residents over 18, you can now book for vaccine. We've opened up more appointments and we've also opened up appointments yesterday for our Doses After Dark event, which is taking place this Saturday from 12.30 p.m. until Sunday at 8.30 p.m. We are aiming to deliver 7,500 needles and arms over a 32-hour marathon vaccine clinic to help close the gap even more and get to our goal. So if you live in Peel, now is the time to get your shot. Please visit peelregion.ca forward slash COVID-19 vaccine to book your appointment now and also to learn about transportation supports and other information about Doses After Dark, where it might be a fun place to get your first dose. While our mass vaccination efforts continue steadily at our hospital and community clinics, our mobile and pop-up clinics continue to reach those who are the hardest to reach in our community. These pop-up clinics in Peel aren't typically open to the general public who can otherwise access our system but they are instead targeted at those who are unable to access vaccination in any other way. Those workers who can't work from home, our homebound and congregate living elderly, and also our most vulnerable. Later this month as well, as I announced this morning, Peel Public Health will open one of Canada's largest vaccination hubs thanks to the support of Bruce Power. This will open at the CAA Centre in Brampton and will provide thousands of additional appointments for vaccine through the back half of May using a hockey hub model first employed in Grey Bruce Health Unit that set a daily vaccination record back in April. There is a critical need for volunteers to support this centre and we encourage interested individuals and organisations who wish to support this initiative to visit peelvaccinehub.ca. Every day is bringing us closer to the end of the acute phase of the pandemic but I must urge everyone to resist the temptation to celebrate too soon. We do not want to see us going backwards. Our success thus far remains fragile, but grows more assured with each passing day. So please continue to stay at home as much as possible. When you must meet someone that you do not live with, only meet in person if it's absolutely necessary. Always distance, mask, and favor the outdoors. Don't meet if you are sick, get tested and self-isolate. And if you are 18 plus and living in Peel, book your vaccine today at peelregion.ca forward slash COVID-19 vaccine. Definitely consider joining us at Doses After Dark this Saturday. I hope to see many of you there. Thank you, and I'll pass it back to Madam Mayor. Thank you, Dr. Lowe. I'm so relieved that Mississauga is finally trending in the right direction. For now, please continue to listen to the advice of public health and keep, your, and keep close contact to that of just your immediate household. And of course, please go and get vaccinated. Before I take questions from the media, I want to acknowledge that I have received many communications from the president of Cup W, um, as well as some postal workers and management who have told me that, uh, that the workers at the Canada Post Gateway facility are doing their best and utmost to follow public health uh, safety guidelines and that they regret that there was an unfortunate incident involving 20 or so employees at that retirement party last month. If I have given the impression that all the employees were disregarding public health guidelines, that was very incorrect and I regret having done so. It was limited to a very small group and of course those actions have been corrected. So thank you and uh, now we are ready to take questions from the media. Welcome. Mayor Crowder, your first question comes from Steve Cornwall at the Mississauga News. Go ahead, Steve. Welcome, Steve. I'm Mayor Crowder, how are you? I'm very well. Thank how you. about you? I'm good, thanks. Uh, Mayor Crowder, you've been advocating for a while now for the province to change its rules in outdoor recreation. Um, there have been times in the past where Mississauga uh, broke somewhat from the province, like when the, the city opted to pause uh, kind of COVID-19 enforcement on dog walkers and dog breeders. So I'm wondering if, if the... Um, why not do kind of a similar enforcement pause on outdoor recreation if it's something uh, you feel really strongly about? 
So I'm going to ask Dr. Lowe in one second to come up and talk about whether we could do some sort of Section 22 about public health, outdoor health. Um, I, I know that in the past he has strongly felt that opening anything at this point would have sent the wrong signals, uh, given that we were our numbers, case counts, hospitalization rates continue to be so high. But now that we're trend, we've plateaued and we seem to be trending downward. Maybe he'll have a change of heart. I'd like to invite Dr. Peter Uni to speak on this topic again, whether uh, he thinks it's right for different regions to go their own path, perhaps in Peel or in Mississauga or the City of Toronto. Dr. Uni, how do you feel? And then we'll ask Dr. Lowe if it's uh, somewhere where he would advocate using his Section 22 power. Dr. Uni? Okay. So what is really important, what we want to avoid, and please, please stick to that. We don't want mobility between public health units, between regions. That's really a no-go. So what I'm concerned about, if we start to do something in Peel, but not in Toronto, that uh, people like me end up in Peel to play uh, basketball or something else, and we don't want that, you know. That's the kind of mobility we want actually to restrict. We don't want people to move between public health units units because they could introduce cases infections so that's important also the other part is important you know if we would you know move on and move into the direction of opening outdoor spaces this doesn't mean that we can let go of the restrictions indoors actually we should do the opposite that's the point the outdoor part would then just you know provide some ease some some uh, some relief also and it's a safe way to deal with that and to get into an, a different kind of groove, then we're all in, you know, just hidden inside. That's great. And we should leverage that. But this means we need clear messaging to say, if we do that outside, this doesn't mean that things actually are over and we need to keep going and need to restrict indoors as much as we can and not deviate from that. Especially in Peel, we know that Peel has been most burdened, you know, during this pandemic. And we need to be extremely careful in the entire province, this holds especially for Peel. Deal. Don't forget also when you're indoors, always wear your mask. Uh, again, you know, this is something which people sometimes take too easily. And if you wear a mask, wear a good one and make sure that there aren't any gaps if you wear it. So uh, I would uh, echo Dr. Uni's uh, um, response. Uh, certainly, uh, we you know we recognize uh, that uh, region hopping has been a problem previously. I also understand uh, from our legal counsel that I don't believe our Section 22 power is intended to be used uh, in the fashion to open things that have been closed uh, per se. Uh, so I think that's uh, that's something that uh, we would. Uh, I mean, just in the interests of uh, of uh, both uh, a legal as well as a preventing region hopping aspect, we would we would probably avoid. Uh, that said, uh, Mayor Crombie is correct that earlier on uh, in um in, well, actually, in the back half of April, uh, when we were seeing our third wave uh, really come uh, come here uh, in full force in the region of Peel, my view was that uh, while outdoor restrictions wouldn't have necessarily been uh, my first place to look for adding measures, I recognized uh, that it did send a message and that uh, it, certainly reversing it at that time would be challenging. I know that our provincial counterparts are working tirelessly to um, review uh, the measures ahead of the stay-at-home order expiring, uh, and I, I am now at a point where we're still starting to see uh, you know, trends in Peel that are favorable uh, that would allow me to say, you know, hopefully we'd be able to revert back to what I had said between the, at the end of the second wave, which is with the weather getting better, is there a way that we can make better use of our outdoor spaces more safely and really revisit some of those measures? And also just reiterating what Dr. Uni has said um, and, and really what I've been saying all along as well, uh, the outdoors the opening or loosening restrictions of the outdoors does not mean we are back to normal. And it does not mean, especially um, because uh, transmission risk is diminished outdoors, a low risk is not no risk. And so you do need to continue maintaining distancing, masking, and certainly getting vaccinated at your first available opportunity. Thanks for the question. Thank you, Steve. Do you have a follow-up? Yep. Yeah, just uh, maybe hoping just to focus in on what on the city part itself. So if I'm piecing together what uh, the doctors have shared there, it's, it's that you kind of don't want to have region hopping. Um, so does that mean, in your opinion, Mayor Crombie, that it wouldn't, be, uh, it wouldn't be a good idea to kind of do a pause on enforcement for recreation stuff happening in 
Mississauga because it could draw other people from other areas to the city? I think uh, Dr. Yuni was probably specifically referring to the golf. Uh, we have two great golf courses here in Mississauga, but often people are members in other regions or other jurisdictions, and he doesn't want to encourage them to travel to use their golf clubs until uh, the stay-at-home uh, order is lifted. But certainly, you know, when the time is right, when Dr. Lowe gives us the go-ahead, we'd, uh, we'd uh, like to see our children uh, playing tennis our, and our adults playing tennis and pickleball and soccer and baseball and uh, basketball along with their siblings. But that's the one that does give me a little bit of anxiety as well. Thank you, Steve. Your next, que your next question comes from Jeffrey Allen at Insaga. Go ahead, Jeffrey. Hello, Mayor Crombie. Welcome, Jeff. Um, you see, thank you. You, uh, you seem to have a lot of outstanding questions with the province. Things like the outdoor recreation, the color code you mentioned, hotspot distribution of the vaccine going forward. Um, how, um, how has the communication been with them? Have they given you feedback? Have they given you any timelines for resolution of some of these questions? I'll tell you, we have the opportunity to speak um, with ministers. The premier himself is very accessible, and we've made it clear that uh, we need clarity. Uh, the big city mayors of the GTA, uh, big city mayors of Ontario, as well as the GTHA mayors, have uh, issued public statements saying we need clarity going forward. We need to let people know so that they can plan uh, when uh, we anticipate being out of lockdown. What does that look like? What is the criteria that will get us there? Will will get us out of there? Will we go back? to that color-coded framework, uh, you know, and, and, and uh, what are the benchmarks um, in each, e each color frame, frankly, because we knew that it was 40 to get into the red, but we didn't know what was the threshold level for the gray, and we're hearing now it's 80. But we need to see there are so many, as you suggested, many unanswered questions. We do need clarity. So we keep hearing that the lo lockdown stay-at-home order uh, will be extended, but we don't have confirmation of that uh, as far as I know. Follow up, Jeffrey? Yeah. Um, do you worry that if Peel continues to run as a hot spot, a little above the provincial average, that uh, Peel, Mississauga might be held back, back from opening in comparison to the rest of the province? It is a concern. It's what we've seen and what we've experienced previously. So we're working very, very hard to get everyone vaccinated. And that's why we're asking for their patience for just a couple more weeks to stay at home and obey all the rules, um, not to leave the region, not, not only to go out for the essentials um, and to make that appointment to get vaccinated. That will... Uh, get that will ensure that uh, we get our, our numbers down, our, our hospitalization rates down, etc. Your next question comes from Pooja Luthra at Y Media. Go ahead, Pooja. Hi, Mayor. Thank you so much for taking my question. But welcome, um, Pooja. I would like to... Thank you. Uh, I would like to know that, you know, it's been uh, like three weeks since you said that, you know, firefighters will help administer doses in Mississauga. So any updates related to that? Yes, I've got some very good news. Our our, our fire chief is here with us, Darren Rizzi, and she's going to she's going to speak to this and tell us all about uh, the great work that our firefighters are doing in administering vaccines over uh, in partnership with Trillium Health Partners. Chief, our fire chief is here for you. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. Thank you for the question. So as you know, I think it was two to three weeks ago, um, we engaged in a partnership with Trillium Health Partners and our firefighters entered into the clinic and they were taught how to do vaccinations. But not only vaccinations, we were taught how to support every part of that clinic. So there's a COVAX system, there's the check-in system, there's obviously the, the vaccination, which, you know, that's the, uh, that's the trophy position that everyone wants to be in. Um, so there's a number of different positions that our firefighters are supporting. So uh, we have four different platoons with 12 firefighters on each platoon, uh, plus two supervisors. So a total of 50 firefighters have been trained to work in the vaccination clinics. Um, and so each of them were to do four training sessions, which they have all 
all completed as of tomorrow, and then we're going to continue on in a, a full capacity after that. Um, we may be moving from UTM over to the hospital. We're just discussing that further. Thank you for the question. Um, thank you so much for the update. Um, my next question is for Dr. Lowe. Oh, no problem, Dr. Lowe. Uh, yeah. Yeah, go ahead with your question. Hi, Dr. Lowe. Um, Hi. I would like to know, you know, has uh, Ontario has paused the use of AstraZeneca vaccine. So is it going to affect the target of vaccinating 150,000 people this week and uh, like the target you have set for 75% to be vaccinated by the end of May? No, is it going to affect the process? No, at this time, the, uh, the um, pause on first doses for AstraZeneca will not impact our uh, overall vaccination system efforts. Uh, those are uh, supplied by uh, different uh, products. And, uh, and so I think uh, we will continue to deliver 20,000 doses a day across our entire system uh, together with our hospital partners and in mass clinics and mobile clinics uh, using the allocations that we have received from the province of uh, alternative vaccine products uh, that have also been approved by Health Canada. Thanks for the question. Thank you. Next question, please. Your next question comes from Isaac Callan at the pointer. Go ahead, Isaac. Hi, McCrombie. Hi, Isaac. Welcome. Hi. Thank you. I want to ask about the diversity survey that was presented this yep. morning. Um, in the city's 2017 diversity strategy, there's a line that says that straight, white, able-bodied men were more likely to see the corporation as more progressive than equity-seeking groups. The survey that you heard this morning basically confirms that. It says that 82% of white staff thought the city was committed to diversity, compared to 56% of black staff. If you look at the city's senior leadership, the city has two white male commissioners, a white male CAO, and the director of strategic initiatives in charge of this file is also a white male. With those findings in mind, is the current senior leadership of the city equipped with the necessary lived experience to deal with the work which it needs to do going forward? You know, it's a tough question, and I thank you for that, Isaac. You do always challenge me, and I will tell you that, you know, our former city manager, CAO, was a woman, uh, and uh, we had a very uh, vibrant uh, succession plan and a process in interviewing, and it was uh, uh, our new CAO won, won over uh, the hearts of the council members. Um, you know, this is a snapshot in time, and, I th and I'm so glad we done the survey so we better understand our employees, and we know where we're at. I think we're all in agreement that our staff should reflect the diversity that is our city, that it should be a microcosm of our city, and we understand that we do have work to do to uh, better recruit, uh, better train, offer leadership positions to uh, everyone, uh, people uh, people of different women, who have different gender, different uh, racialized backgrounds, etc. So we do know that in the 30 to 49 cohort group, uh, there is uh, there is many more who are racialized and uh, many more women, and particularly in our high potential group. Uh, so, you know, I thank you for the question, but I think it was important to do the study to understand where we are today and it make it give, give ourselves um, a roadmap of where we, uh, where we want to go, where we need to go, and uh, put a plan and strategy in place to help us get us there. I do have Rob Trewortha here. He did um, stick handle the diversity survey, the diversity inclusion survey, um, and, is, uh, and I'd like to, for him to come up and speak to the plan going forward. We know what we know. You have outlined it very well. We, we discussed it this morning. We know we have a lot of work to do. So, Rob, why don't you come up and tell us the types of uh, strategy we have going forward so that we can address these very telling issues that uh, Isaac has identified. Thank you. Over to you, Rob. And if you could hit on the lift experience as well, Rob, I'd appreciate that. Thank you, Isaac, and uh, uh, thank you for the question. And as you heard me say this morning, you know, a lot of our strategy going forward will be led by Uzma Shakir, uh, who comes to us from the City of Toronto and enjoyed seven years working directly for the City Manager at that time, and who built the uh, Diversity, uh, Equity and Human Rights Office at the City of uh, Toronto. And, you know, if you take a look at some of her writings, some of the awards that she's won, uh, she's a very accomplished woman. And so we're quite lucky to have her on board and to lead these efforts. I do recognize that I'm the one that uh, is overseeing this portfolio, but Uzma will really be the one that's driving it forward. 
uh, with respect to the plan moving forward, as you saw in the research, uh, our focus will really be on uh, those areas uh, that uh, were concerned uh, of concern in the data, including the barriers and gaps in succession planning and talent management. And there's a number of uh, pieces of work already ongoing on that. But it's also about hearing the voices of those with the lived experience and making sure that those voices are not just heard, but that their feedback and uh, their uh, input is actioned uh, and listened to at the highest levels. And that's where I mentioned in the uh, in the survey this morning and in, in my rollout that we have established an equity advisory council uh, that will be uh, established in June. We're actually out right now asking employees for their interest in joining it. And the idea would be is that this group of probably between 12 and 14 employees uh, would provide feedback uh, through USMA to the leadership team uh, and result in recommendations that uh, hopefully we can action. Um, and this would provide, you know, uh, a sounding board, a safe space to have these discussions. It's also likely the precursor to uh, employee resource groups and other um, groups that could be formed across the city with uh, some of our employees that you've referenced that uh, do not identify as uh, white, able-bodied men, uh, to hear their voice and to, uh, to bring their concerns and their perceptions to the fore. So, you know, that lived experience needs to be reflected more. We need to understand why people perceive the corporation the way that they do. Uh, and that work is going to commence with Ernest uh, when Uzma begins on the 25th. Follow up, Isaac? Uh, yeah, for me, Crombie, please. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Isaac. Thank you, Isaac. I, I appreciate that, and I appreciate Rob speaking to it as well, because as mayor, obviously, you're an important person in the city, but the entire recruitment policy isn't yours alone to handle. Where, I suppose, you come into it more is in the mayor's office itself, where you have a little more say over the staffing. And I want to know, do you think that the mayor's office is a microcosm of the city of Mississauga in how it's staffed in terms of diversity? And if it's not, what are you going to do to make sure that your section of the city is as diverse as it should be? Mm -hmm. It's a good question, Isaac. I thank you for that. I have uh, six employees. I have uh, um, uh, uh, Benigal, is Shaila Benigalis, Bengalis, Muslim. Uh, Sarah is um, Lebanese. Uh, Shafia is Guyanese. Um, Janet is Polish. Daniel is half Jewish, half Italian. I think we have a pretty good cross section, actually, um, in my in my office. So we are uh, we're actually very female heavy in my office. Um, uh, we have only one male employee, but we we you know I always do try to hire with uh, the lens to if I have two capable people, two people of equal merit, I'd like to give the nod to the person of of diversity. Your final question of the day comes from Khaled Salama at My Second Home TV. Go ahead, Khaled. Thank you, Daniel. Hi, Mayor. How are you? Welcome. Thousands of residents in Mississauga uh, and Peel actually uh, received already AstraZeneca vaccine. Now they are in the blue. Are you going to give them two doses, mix, or what would be the situation here? Um, you know, that's a very good question, and I'm not going to answer any medical questions. I'm going to ask Dr. Lowe to come and address that. Thank you, Khaled. You are a doctor now. <laughs> uh, thank you for the question, Khaled. Uh, at this point in time, we are awaiting further provincial guidance uh, as to uh, how to proceed with individuals who received AstraZeneca as their first dose. I do want to say two very important things here. For those individuals who did receive AstraZeneca as your first dose, thank you. You did your part, and certainly the increased vaccine coverage that came uh, through making use of AstraZeneca really helped to protect even more uh, of our citizens here in the region of Peel. Um, and certainly it was absolutely vital that at the time, uh, especially when we were in the midst of our third wave through April, uh, we really took on, uh, I think, the benefits of the protection provided by this disease uh, against the really, really significantly low risk of a very rare side effect uh, that, as you know, is now being increasingly observed in the signal and is starting to tip the risk benefit a little bit differently as we start to see the third wave coming down. But I think uh, for those who did receive AstraZeneca, you did the same, you did the right thing. The second thing I will share, I understand from our provincial uh, uh, counterparts uh, that you will be taken care of. Uh, there is 
a review underway at the federal level uh, to figure out how mixing doses might look uh, you know, using uh, uh, study data from Western Europe and the UK. Uh, and we also know uh, that there is still AstraZeneca as well that may uh, be uh, you know, used for second doses possibly. They're looking at that because the pause really pertains to first doses at this time. So I know that the province is actively working on this uh, and I anticipate that they will issue their guidance uh, as to for the individuals who have been vaccinated with one dose of AstraZeneca, uh, what they will be doing around second doses in the future. Thanks for the question. This is for you, also, Dr. Lo. Sure, go ahead, Khaled. Thank you. For the afterdirt, how did you manage to allocate uh, additional resources? Did you hire extra staff? Uh, did you have to uh, use volunteers? Or how did you make it? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we, uh, thanks to the provincial allocation and uh, to hotspots, uh, we've actually increased uh, and staffed up uh, our operations across all of our mass vaccination clinics. Uh, we know our hospital partners have done the same as well. Willem Osler has moved into a new larger center. Uh, we're making the use of all the allocation that's been there, and we're having we're going to have our biggest uh, vaccination week to date yet, 150,000 doses in arm. Arms for doses after dark. Uh, we we basically did rely on our, our usual staff complement, uh, navigating through that, uh, and it is a good opportunity uh, for us to really test uh, overnight hour uh, demand and availability, uh, and use that information for our planning. We know that we have a lot of shift workers in our region. We have a lot of young people. Uh, we know that people uh, don't have a lot of time during the day, so we're looking to see if this flexibility of having doses after dark uh, may be something that we would offer more regularly based on uh, on the mm -hmm. outcomes. And I really encourage everyone. We're trying to get to 7,600 doses uh, over a 32-hour dose marathon. If you haven't had a first dose yet, now's the time. You know, if, you, if, if you're a appeal resident over 18 plus, and also if you happen to be one of those groups like workers who live or who work in Peel, uh, you know, certainly we are really encouraging everyone uh, to come and be part of something special at Doses After Dark. So thank you so much for the question. Was that our last question? And that's your last question. Thanks Thank you for everyone for joining. Thank you for. Thank you.